And like, I could like try to help other people so much, but like, there will always be those things that I can't get rid of. You know what I'm saying? Like that are just there. And so uh, that was definitely my, that was definitely my lowest point for sure. You know, sidetrack because I'm sure you'll get your haircut eventually, but I fall off into, if I need something from someone that I haven't talked to in a while, sometimes I'll just shoot the text Yeah. with no, uh, with, uh, what's it called? Uh, like no greeting, no wishing. Wa- and then I have to do it, uh, afterwards. And it's always weird. Oh, Hey, how, Oh, and also, uh, yeah. And yeah. also, and also I hope you're doing well and it's a little fabricated, yeah. you know, it, like if you want something, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go on it. Welcome back to impulsive, the number one podcast in the world. Uh, you guys might notice the energy is a little different today. Mm. It's cause we are missing someone like Mac is switched seats completely. Just mm. hopped across the table. I'm the new co-host. He's replacing Mike, mm-hmm. um, and and Mike's Mike's cool. He's a good guy, and so we <laughs> actually decided to make this whole entire episode about him uh, mm-hmm. for the first time ever. Mike is going to be the guest on Impulsive because you guys may or may not know today is the day that his book is being released. It's called The Fifth Vital, and uh, he's spent probably a good the better half of a decade working on this piece of work, and I cannot imagine how stressful that would be, how much weight is on this. So I'm excited as a friend to pick his brain and also seeing his journey, hearing the stories late at night. You guys have just have a little taste. I've been able to dive deep into this man's brain and had the privilege mm. of listening to it. Not everyone has the privilege of getting to read his book and learn about his mistakes and why he's been able to trans transform his life into what it is coming from literally the lowest of the lows that you'll hear about today. So ladies and gentlemen, you've seen him on 180 plus episodes episodes of Impulsive. He is our co-host, our roommate, our business partner, and our best friend. It is Mike Malak, ladies and gentlemen, published author. This feels weird. I was going to ask, what's it it like? (laughs) Nope, this is not okay. No? I I, I like it. I can tell you already, this is not okay, boys. Really? Do you want to switch? We we actually can. I I know what it's- No, 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 I got this. Okay. You're the guest, man. Okay. You are the guest, Mike. And it's it's crazy because we were, we were talking. We're like we're like I wonder if Mike's going to be able to fill the space this podcast, the one a podcast where you are supposed to talk. You think you're going to be able to do it? The pressure is immense. Yeah, I, feel, I can I, imagine. I, I honestly already need a break. I can imagine. I'm, I'm stressed out. I'm dead serious. Mike, this is Mike. horrifying for me. I don't like being on the side of the desk, even though I'm always. Uh, trying to command the attention when yeah. someone says, "Here you go, it's yours." I get sweaty, I get hot, and I get nervous. Yeah, and that's exactly how I feel right fucking. Bro, now. embrace it, absorb it. And by the way, how could you not? I've been, I've been uh, having conversation with Mac and people around the house, and it's like that book that you're holding in front of you, the fifth vital. I care so much for you. And uh, by proxy, I also care so much about this book because this contains your life in it. This is your life in a novel. And you said something to me. You're like, bro, what if people don't like it? That's my life. This is not like a piece of fiction that you made. This is nonfiction and it is directly correlated to you as a person. I cannot imagine the amount of tremendous stress and emotion that you're going through with the release of this book. Your first one. This week has been... Stressful. It has been. I'm already stressed. I'm already tired. I'm already anxious. And uh, now I'm doing shows. I'm doing shows like this. I'm doing interviews. It's uh, eight years. Eight years of of work has gone into this book. And the book itself contains the, you know, 26 years that led into that. And so the 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 amount this book means to me, it means to my life is is tremendous. Why I why I love this for you, not only as a friend, but as a uh, as a peer is because typically along the timeline of a YouTuber's life, they'll do a couple things where they'll venture off. They'll make a song, start a podcast, Mm -hmm. publish a book. And I I have to stop you and say this chair goes back so far. Like I can... (laughs) Lock it on the side. No, no, no. (laughs) Just chilling. I No, so a lot of YouTubers that release books, I, I, I I would feel confident in saying there's not... 5% 5% of the substance that you have in this book. This is this was a thing that you told me you were making before you even like knew what a YouTube was. One of the very first things you told me when we started developing our friendship was, hey man, I don't know if I've told you this, but I've been like writing a book for the past five years about my life because I also don't know if you know this, but I've been addicted to drugs for, for 10 years and it 
uh, claimed a better portion of my life. And I'm putting it into a novel and I, I write, you know, every, every night. And the fact that it's coming to fruition now, I just want to pick your brain about it. And I know a lot the answers to a lot of these questions, but I'm going to give you oops because beyond the eons of wisdom that you've imparted to me and the impulsive audience, this book is a side to that people have not seen. And, and sure, our goal is to sell the book, <laughs> but your goal is to sell the book, but I'm here to help. But also there's a lot to be taken away from this. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> this book is, uh, it's everything. It's completely uncensored. When I wrote this book, there was a million times where I went back and forth with myself and said, is this appropriate? Is this something that you want to tell? Is this something you want people to know? And every time I didn't, I, 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 from a macro standpoint, the easiest way for me to, to, to say this is I did not want to really, I really did not want to tell this story. It was not comfortable. It, do, it did not feel good to tell the, the story that I told in this book. It hurt. It was painful. It brought back memories that <clears throat> I already am choking down right now because it, it, it uh, the feeling associated with those memories is so painful to me. When I first started writing it, there was going to be a lot of censor, censored stuff. Mm -hmm. There was going to be a lot of stuff that I kept out. And it was going to be a, a cookie cutter story of drug addiction and rehabilitation. When you gave me a platform or a sniff of a platform, no pun intended, mm -hmm. <laughs> and people started messaging me and saying, yo, your story makes me feel this way. Your story, I, I, I have struggled with this. I've struggled with that. My mom did this, whatever. Your story makes me feel okay. makes me want to keep going. Even some people who said, your story makes, it, makes me feel like it's okay to be 27 without knowing exactly what you want to do for the rest of your life. Because mm. I was there. Mm. I was 33 with no idea what the fuck I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Mm. As soon as I started hearing that stuff, I never, I, I never cut another thing. Really? I brought back everything that I had cut. That is everything. It's everything. It's every sick, twisted regret disgusting thing that I that I can't wrap my brain around how bad of a state that I was in to have done the things that I did is in this book. Wow. I know I know some of these stories. Yeah, yeah. Why are you comfortable with people knowing these things about you? I'm not. I'm not comfortable with it, to be honest with you. I somebody asked me, uh, one of the reporters done a bunch of interviews, a bunch of a press on the front side of this book, and one of the reporters asked me, um, how do you feel right now? Like knowing that this is all about to go out. And mm -hmm. I said, it feels like someone is about to pull my pants down in front of the entire world. And I know it. <sighs> and there's absolutely nothing that I could do to stop it. Oh, no. And so, um, what was the question again? <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was a great answer. It was a great yeah, answer. It's, 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 it's How are you it. comfortable? You said you're not. And I, I, it's, that's what I'm saying. Does, Mike, I've, I've had the pleasure. You're, you're a great orator. You tell great stories and you're mm -hmm. hilarious. And I've had the pleasure of some nights, a little gem of a story will slip out of your mouth. And I'm like, I go, wait, pause, rewind. What the fuck are you saying? Some of these things you have are like straight out of a movie. And that'd be crazy if one day this was adapted to a movie. It's already in the talks. Right no, now. no way. Yeah. yeah. The, my, my partner and co-author Riley J. Ford has already had a couple, uh, or one of her books for sure go and, and be made into a Netflix movie. So she's talking to them about this one already. Um, I would love for that to happen, but yeah, I mean, can I, can I give some yeah, context sure. for people who don't know your background? Like I'm you, you've, you've touched on it, Yeah. but Mike, what were you addicted to? Well, let's jump into it. <laughs> <laughs> like like I, that I, I'm trying, that I'm trying to a complex like, answer. <laughs> how bad was it? Uh, as bad as it could get, as bad as it could get. Um, this was not a, this was not some like, uh, yo, I have a, uh, over prescription to Xanax and I don't really like how they make me feel. So I'm going to stop. This was a, a 10 year, uh, day after day, blood bath fight to the death bout with the, the addiction to opiates and, and, uh, amphetamines and Xanax and everything under the fucking sun. Um, I, I like to consider that I was one of the forgotten ones and, and people have already asked me and maybe you would, you know, who this book was for. Why did you write this book? You have a you have a YouTube audience who wants to see you uh, uh, you know jump off the roof into a ball pit. Mm -hmm. Do that. Mm. Why are you doing this? This this book is for the people who have nothing left to live for. They have no hope left, and that's exactly where I was from the age of eighteen years old. When uh, sorry, sixteen years old, when I was given my first 
Oxycontin mm. in, in a hospital bed because I'd broken my femur. The feeling that that gave me, the relief that it gave me over the thoughts that have spun in my head since I was a kid and the, the relief from the pain I felt physically, emotionally, mentally, the, that was then followed up by uh, months of painkillers being prescribed to me. And I've been through that loop about five times for different surgeries mm-hmm, that I've had in, mm-hmm. my, in my life. Um, when it came time for me to be 18, when I was 18 years old, I tried my first Oxy on the streets. Oxycontin and I sniffed a 20 milligram Oxycontin and, and from that day I always remember the day it was, it was right down the street from my high school um, uh, I was actually 17 I was a junior in high school by the time I was a senior in high school I was a full blown uh, addict and I couldn't go to school I couldn't um, I, I did but I would sweat very similarly to the way you see me sweat on the yeah, show yeah. but not from nervousness but from uh, withdrawals to opiates I have two things yeah. one I think it's incredibly noble that you were as raw as you are in this book for the sake of the people who were going through what you went through. Uh, don't take this offensively, but, but when you were in that stage and during the, that decade of battling uh, substance abuse and addiction, were you reading? Were you consuming content? Like, like will, they, will they take the proactive action of reading a 300-page book? It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And, and my, the answer for me is no. Um, it depends on, you know, it depends on the level of the addict, depends on how desperate their life is. It depends on what, you know, their living arrangement. I mean, when I was for the majority of my addiction and the majority of the time that I spent, uh, dependent on drugs and, and, and whatever, I, I had no home. Do you know what I'm saying? I slept on couches. I slept, I've slept in trunks of cars. I've slept in, I've slept outside, slept on the street. Um, and, uh, there, no, there was never a time where I was like, yo, there's a new book about to drop except for one time. And that was when I, when I took my first step to get clean and went to rehab. And you find yourself in a hospital setting with no hope. But well, actually, let me, let me rephrase that. You find yourself in a hospital setting with a brand new hope and a, and a brand new kind of lease on life. Mm. Yo, I might actually do this every time. And a lot of people, a lot of people who deal with addiction go to rehab multiple times. Yeah. But every time you go, it's just a little spark. Like, yo, maybe this is the time. Yep. And your family says, yo, maybe this is the time he gets it right. And they have that little hope. Yep. That's when you. That's when you want this book. Mm. That's when you want this book. Mm, mm. That's on, on the when, way up. When 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 you're in rehab, when you're in rehab, you have nothing to do. Mm. You have no. You, you you go to groups. You 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 spend a lot of time by yourself reflecting, thinking about things that you regret or things you wish you could have done better, or how you would have treated your wife better if the circumstances weren't the way they were, mm-hmm. and you have a lot of time to read. You have a ton of time to read. I read a lot when I was in rehab. And, uh, and so this is a, gr- I, I think it's a great piece for, for anybody. And I think we're in a different age now. A lot of the people that do reach out to me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook or whatever are, are currently addicts. Mm-hmm. You know, I have two years, five years, eight years. I've been shooting heroin. I can't believe you're releasing this book. Like I, I've been going through this for so long and no one's ever spoke for me. I've never seen a celebrity. I've never, and especially a YouTuber. I've never seen a YouTuber. Wow. That is, that is fascinating. Story. Yeah. You know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if it, for, for people that can get it, it's, it's, it's great. And I, w- and I will get this book to fucking rehabs. I will. I, I don't care if I have to buy a thousand copies myself. Like this mm-hmm. book will, will be on the shelf. It should also be said that Mac took the, uh, the cover yeah, image, I did. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is awesome. Uh, yeah. Mike, I know your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Know your family. Robin. I know your sister. Yeah. They're, they're, they're gems. All of them. Mm-hmm. So sweet. So kind. How does a 17 year old from Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, get ad- addicted to drugs with a loving family, mother, sister, father, everything? Well, that I think that's like the biggest part of the story is that it quite literally can happen to anyone. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It, it, and, it, and it is. It is. I mean, the, the biggest the biggest story here is this book is a story of the past. And it's a story of things that happened to me. And I want it to be a tale of hope so that people can climb out and and hopefully live whatever version of success is for themselves. But the bigger story here that's partially told and that is ongoing and present is the fact that more than 2 million people in this country right now are going through the same exact thing that I want. They're your brothers, they're your sisters, they're your best friends, they're your moms, your dads, your teachers, your janitors, the people that you knew as a kid growing up but haven't heard from in 15 years. Everyone knows someone who is struggling with this opiate epidemic that has claimed thousands and thousands and thousands of lives in this country. How did it happen to me? In the early 2000s, there was a, there was a tidal wave of 
narcotics prescriptions written. Mm. And in all honesty, a large chunk of my graduating class was was an opiate addict by the time they graduated high school. All of them with loving families, all of them with with nice white picket fences, dogs, all that shit. But there was such a saturation and so such a, a mass amount of these pills that when they hit, they it was a tidal wave. It was a tidal wave. And there's and there's shows about this, like the pharmacist on Netflix right now that are that are massive telltales about Purdue Pharma and their overprescription. Is this is this this isn't the actual mm-hmm. It's not the actual book. God, I was gonna read the uh the uh, uh what's it called in the beginning? The the preface? No, the your thanks your thanks or the, your, the I, can, I can get I can get your it, shout yeah. outs? What are yeah, they called? The acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Yeah. You gave the acknowledge acknowledgements to everyone who you felt played a pivotal part in your life, and then at the, the very end you said to Purdue Pharma, dot, 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 fuck you. Yeah. You've been very outspoken about the opioid epidemic. I mean, imagine if there was one beer. Imagine if there was one kind of cocaine that mm-hmm. was everywhere. It was just one brand. Mm-hmm. One fucking brand did this. One company, bro, with all the thousands of other competitors, all the other thousands of pills on the market, one pill did this. The holy grail of narcotics. Oxycontin. Bro, Oxycontin. You, you trace back any opiate addiction story right now. And there's a ton, which is another reason I almost didn't write this book. The, the, the prevalence it's of this story is, is saturated as fuck right yeah, now. Yeah. Unfortunately for my competitors, they don't have millions of subscribers and the <laughs> best friends with Logan Paul, great podcast. But uh, <laughs> but um, it all traces back to one place, yeah. Stanford, Connecticut. How ironic. Damn. The last city I fucking lived and worked hmm. in before I moved here. Purdue Pharma. I'm calling conspiracy. Crazy. Not my, not, <laughs> he did it to himself for the, this. The, the, the Sackler family, one of the most powerful families in, in, in the world, produced this magical they called it the 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 miracle drug Mm -hmm. the miracle pill it was oxycontin it was going to be the pill that solved all of the problems of the chronically ill you take this pill it's got a time release seal on it when you take it the 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 pill will the seal will allow the pill to to be released at a pace so the person could take one pill and be good for two days now these are terminal cancer patients or chronically uh acute with acute pain Mm -hmm. Somehow, whether they knew it was going to happen or not, as soon as that pill hit the streets, people found out how to take the time release seal off of it. I learned how to take the time release seal off an Oxycontin when I was 17 years old in my friend's uh, Mitsubishi in the, in the passenger seat as he played Bone Thugs in Harmony. I sucked an, eight, an 80 milligram Oxycontin seal off, which then rendered that time release completely useless and allowed you to obliterate the pill and turn it into prescribed heroin. Wow. And... At the time, pr- prior, prior to OxyContin, back things up 20 years to when your parents partied and my parents partied, there was Quaaludes. We had, we had Wolf of Wall Street on the show. Yeah. There was Quaaludes. There was always uh, different pills for mood boosting and this and that. And there was Percocet and there was Vicodin. Mm-hmm. Purdue Pharma put 32 Percocets behind a uh, time release seal. 32. So when you look at that pill, you say, oh, that's a pill. I've had one of those. I've had a, I've had a Percocet before. I could eat OxyContin. Mm-hmm. And you just left your 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 first play as a as a freshman, your freshman in high school, and you go to a party and you played basketball the night and your team won, and somebody says, "Yo, this is like a Percocet, man. Take one of these, eighty milligram oxy." Chokes to death on his vomit in the backseat of the car. Freshman high school. You know, that story is happened to our happened to our substitute. Hundreds of thousands happened to our bro. substitute at uh, at chalk. at high school. Yeah. Uh, our gener or the generation right above us, I think I've told you this, in our city. That was my that was that would have been me, right? Our high school was nicknamed Heroin Hot. Right. You guys had a real big problem yeah. with it. Yeah. It, it, it was a couple years before. Just missed us. Yep. But I did I until I uh, got to know you and you explained to me this um this problem, I was not aware of how uh, how prevalent this the opiate epidemic was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's massive. It's uh, massive. Mike, I've talked to you about this. This is actually scary to say, but it happened to me. Uh, yeah. I was 14, had kidney surgery, and started taking pills, and then I wanted to take more, and then I would get more. Mm-hmm. Not not seeking them, but the, they're doctor prescribed. Did you know that? Did he ever tell you this? He actually I, was- you did, you did, You're a heroin addict? I'm not a heroin addict, but I they prescribed heavy uh, opioids, yeah. and uh, you, once you start taking them, you just 
keep taking them because it makes you feel good. I actually, um, I, I, I will, I will not take the pain meds after my yeah. surgeries. They always give me Vicodin, and I never, and I, because I am too afraid to uh, go down a hole that I'm not. I have an addictive personality, and I know. I know that is not a place I want to be. It's it's smart of you and noble, and it brings up a, another conversation that um, I've personally wrestled with and every addict deals with on a daily basis, which is the question of uh, choice versus disease. Mm-hmm. Massively argued point. Is addiction a disease? Currently, the way that the medical community states it, it is a chronic, treatable disease. But there are a lot of people out there who say, but whose choice is it to try drugs in the first place? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, a va- it's a valid point. It's, it's a, at the very least something that I'm willing to argue or, or debate. Mm. Whose choice is it to get sick? So, so the people who are first prescribed, that's, a whole, that's the that's, main argument. Right. Like if you're prescribed narcotics and you become addicted to them, it wasn't your choice. Right. So, and and the, the crazy uh, people will say, well, I've had, sur- and not the same way you're saying, but I've had surgery and I didn't take pain pills. So other people should fucking do that. Like there's some blanket answer, which there's not. But there's always this ongoing debate. And the the biggest story that's that's in this lightly, I wish I was I wish I talked about a little bit more. And the biggest story we need to talk about today is that there is a unbreakable eternal bond between substance abuse and one other very important topic, which is mental illness. Hmm. The link between mental illness and drug abuse, it is pretty much 100% one for one. If you find a drug addict, you've probably found someone who suffers from some semi-immense level of mental illness. So to say that it's a choice for someone to take drugs for that first time, you are discounting or not taking into account the mental illness that may have pushed someone to try drugs for the first time. And, and so listen, there's a lot of people out there who luckily have the luxury, and this is another excerpt I wish I could pull up. This book is fucking loaded with these points. In the, in the afterthoughts, I, I, I wrote this piece that said, to the person who has never suffered. Something along the lines of, may you understand the luxury and the privilege that you have been awarded in this life. May you also, I pray that you also see the importance and the ability for yourself to spread the light that you have been given to the people less fortunate and understand. And I've said this on the show and is, I think the most clipped part that has ever happened besides the Riley Reed deep throat. <laughs> <laughs> but when I gave that speech on depression yeah. on Evan's episode, yep. which is now the most viewed episode. If you know someone out there who's struggling with depression or anxiety or drug abuse or self mutilation, I urge you, to find a way to add some sort of value to that person's life. And that usually comes through self-discovery, patience, just trying just a little bit harder to be empathetic to what that person's going through. And it's not easy. We talk about this all the time. I'm about to say, it's it's fascinating how it comes through self-discovery. Because for me, patience, the, the word you use, is like the thing that I... I need to I need to get better at it. Should I be ever? It probably won't happen again. But in a a scenario where I could be helping a friend out or so, my light, my attempt to bring the light to the world is because I do feel blessed in that. Like I wouldn't say I suffer, right? Inherently, and a lot of people do. My light is my attempt to uh, do what I do, make content, and attempt to get people away from whatever the fuck's going on Which in their is life. Great. Distract Which them for is a second. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Except I know I can, I know I can be better with the people around me, mm-hmm. and it, and it is coming th- through self discovery with like like you said, patience is the biggest thing for me. Delivery, um, empathy, which we've talked about before on the show. It's it it's super uh, internalized. The answers the answers aren't floating here. You got to find them within yourself, and and then and then project that onto the people that you love and say you care about. It's is this is a deep topic. Yeah, it's deep. It's deep. It's, and it's, and it's, it's and it's tough to and it's tough to like this show is supposed to be upbeat. It's supposed to be it's supposed to be exciting and honestly especially like, you. Especially you're me. upbeat for Mike. <laughs> and and to be to be this guy like is um it it really is a challenge for me cuz I want to mm. laugh. I want to joke around, but it's like it's like every time I I I 
make a joke or every time like I talked about in the last episode or the one that comes out after it's like every time like I like cash a check for some like mean like meaningless thing that I do it's like I have this little thing in the back of my mind that's like you what are you doing for the use of the next generation mm. what are you doing for the people that are are at rock fucking bottom right now what are you doing to try to make those people feel better? It's always in the back of my mind. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. And, yep. And, that, and that's this, that's this, that's, this is what I hope is my offering to those people that they can read this and that they could feel better. Did you have a, did you have a rock bottom moment and all is lost moment? Like truly, what was, what was the lowest point in your life? And is it in that book? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of them. Um, the majority of them for me were centered around my mother. Um, you you know my mom. Mm -hmm. You know how close I am to her. Yep. And um, you know like how important she is to me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. so the majority of my the majority of my uh, of my lows and my rock bottoms were a result of hurting my mom. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying. It's a uh, it's a uh, there. I I don't know that there's a pain in this world worse than hurting the person that made you. Do you know what I'm saying? Or worse than hurting the person that gave their all to make you who you are and to, to, to keep you alive as, as a child, you know? And, uh, um, and so the majority of my, my, my regrets and my pain comes from that. But, but honestly, I guess it's connected to it, but I've talked about this a little bit, but my, my rock bottom, my true rock bottom was in, uh, 2000 in, in 2010, um, I, I started a new drug because I was offered it in, in my lowest, you know, non-thinking point of my life, uh, crack cocaine. And bro, crazy. Like, think <laughs> about what I'm fucking saying to you right now, bro. Yeah. Like, think about what I'm saying to you. Like, I was I was just a regular white Connecticut kid. And I and I put white on it just because whether it's, you know, for whatever reason, but crack cocaine is generally thought to be an inner city drug, uh -huh. right? And so you're suburbs, Mike. I, I was just you, a, acknowledging just a your kid. privilege. I, yeah, yeah, I was a privileged yeah, yeah, yeah. kid, bro. A middle class community, a middle class community, and at, and at one point, someone offered me crack cocaine, mm -hmm. and I I tried it, and what what ensued was a was the worst year of my life, and ironically or or sadly and unfortunately, that time coincided with a another massive struggle in my mother's life, which was her starting to come to terms with the fact that her father was about to die. And my mom and my grandfather were the, one of those storied mom, dad relationships. My grandfather fought in Okinawa, survived world war two, survived the great depression was a warrior and, and provided against all odds right, for my family, for my mom and her, her brother. She loved him so much. And when she found out that he had Parkinson's, and dementia and he was going to unfortunately die in a state that we talked about what just happened to your yeah. grandma it, it ruined her it it, it 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 i could tell and i, I write about that in the book it, it destroyed her inside and she and it came to a point where she had nowhere else to turn she she didn't have enough money to put him in a home they were going to repossess his house it just was an unfortunate unfortunate circumstance and she said I think she just like dug within her and she was like, Hey, like, can you, can you go watch after pop up? Like, all you have to do is these three things like every day, just make sure he doesn't fucking leave the house, kill himself, like fall down the stairs. Like he shouldn't be doing these things. And, and everything inside of me wanted to be like, yeah, mom, I could do that. Well, maybe like six months to a year into it, I had started this new drug and there was a day when my grandfather was in his recliner. He was downstairs and uh, he was, he was just screaming like, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Like he was, he was stuck in the chair. He couldn't, he couldn't get up and he had to go to the bathroom and he probably was like peeing and shitting himself and was just in, in the worst way that you could ever imagine. And uh, I was in the attic uh, smoking crack. I was paranoid and I couldn't help my grandfather. And uh, the, like, honestly, like, that that moment will never be erased from my mind it's like i can do i can do so much and like i could like try to help other people so much but like there will always be those things that i can't get rid of you know what i'm saying like that are just there and so uh that was definitely my that was definitely my lowest point
for sure. Did, did you know it was a low point then? Or did you just keep going on doing what you were doing? No, I knew. I knew. I knew I was in trouble. I, I think at that point, um, it's just wild to imagine, but like, for people that get into that kind of place in their life, th- there comes a point where you, uh, there comes a point where you uh, accept the fact that you are, you're finished. You're messed up. No, no, no. You're done. It's over. Mm. It's over. There was, there was, uh, I, I was, I was going to go out as Mike Malak, the heroin addict. That was my, that was my, my life. I was 20, I was 25 years old and I was, I had accepted and so had my mother. My mother had accepted that fact. We weren't, we e- even, even when she had me move into her father's house, she uh-huh. was at peace with the fact that her son had was was going to die to this to this epidemic. So it was open. You your mom knew about this. Oh yeah. There, it, it, once you become that level and you get to that level, there's no way to hide it. My my parents knew that I was a drug addict when I was 20 years old, when I was or, or even 19 years old. They knew something was going on. Was there open conversation about it, or was it just swept under the rug? I was a I was a. I was a psychopath. I was a psychopath. You couldn't like this, this, the the majority of this book is stories that you, when I, when I first worked with my first partner on this and, and similar. So a lot of people ask me like, how did you write this book? Cause I see another author's name on it. I wrote every part of this book word for word, every single piece of it. There's not a piece that was written for me. What I needed someone to come in and do was organize, yeah. strategize. Where is this going to go? How is this going to work? When I brought the first one in and he started reading it, he kept marking sections of the book and saying, you can't say this because it makes it seem like people want you. To, it makes it seem like you want people to believe it really happened. Oh, and I go, no, 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 that that fucking happened. Oh, bro. Oh, God. There's either proof of it, there's a cop that has a report of it. Like the stories in this book are so fucked up. Are so fucked up, bro. That there's the majority of people probably will be like, yo, there's no way this could have fucking happened. Wow. Like, like the amount of times I've seen the inside of my body is horrifying. The amount of times I've seen bones fucking shattered. Like I, I've woken up in pools of blood with my foot here. My left foot here, right here, dude, next to my head. I love this story. He tells it. Usually it's funny or not so serious. That was the skiing. Yeah. When you say you saw your foot next to your head. Next to my head, within a half an inch, and blood all around me. I looked, I opened my eyes, and there were people. That was when I had my first OxyContin because of that accident. There were people staring all around me, looking down at me. And I got, and I got, (laughs) I got dragged down the hill on, I try to laugh about the shit now. It's fucking ridiculous, but uh, I got dragged down the hill on a snowmobile. And had to go in for surgery. And I remember uh, my mom was on the phone. I was four hours away from home. Everyone else had left for the day because they were like, yo, we have to get on this bus back to Connecticut. We were in Killington in Vermont skiing. My mom's like, all I remember was this little flash of my mom like crying. And I, the next time I woke up and I was in traction, my foot was attached to the ceiling because they had to separate the femur far enough uh. to f- stick a titanium rod into my femur and then screw it at my hip and my knee. That was, that was, I should have died. I should have died from the splenectomy a year earlier when I ruptured my spleen and they had to go in and uh, cut my entire stomach open and remove one of my vital organs. Like this story is fucked. And that's why I knew I had to write it. That's why I knew I had to tell it. I was like, yo, like, (laughs) when did you start writing? Wait, wait, what what about the one where your leg got caught in a pothole? Yeah, that was 2008. That, and by the way, worst injury, even though it was not the most life threatening, I'll, I'll just tell the story. The whole, the whole story quickly. This is at a time when I'm selling a lot of heroin, a lot. Like, like it got it's got to a point where, and I, this was all. Can you too, get in trouble for saying this now? No, nah, I believe I believe we're past statute of limitations. Jed, you can go ahead and ch- fact check me on that. One, but it's all in the book, so okay. fucking come grab me, dude. Because <laughs> if it ain't today, it's tomorrow. All right, it's all in the fucking book. But I um, I I was doing everything I did to support my own addiction. Uh-huh. I had to, it was it was how I was going to do it, and I was so I was selling even, the worst possible thing. I was making other people's lives miserable. At the time, I thought I was a doctor. Sick people would come to me. I would make them not sick. It was, I felt great about it. Obviously, now I see the, the harm in my ways. Yeah. But moreover, I was, I, was hel- I was trying to take care of my desperate self. Like, how am I going to get drugs today? Was always the question. That's the same question. Imagine asking yourself that same question every day. It's the only question you ever ask yourself. Uh-huh. 
So I go to meet this kid. Me and this kid had beef. He was a, he was a dealer in the same city as me. He, and there's always this crate, you know, hopefully a lot of people don't know what this is about, but <laughs> there's a lot of beef between connects in each city. You don't want other people touching your customer base. You don't want other people touching your plug. You want to have the everything. It's, yep. it's, it's all, you want it all to be yours. This kid couldn't get drugs that day. He was dry. He had a lot of customers that he wanted to serve. It was Memorial Day, 2008. It's in West Haven, Connecticut. I don't really. Okay. I leave. I go to the house. I meet me. I pull up brand new Infinity G35 that I didn't pay for. It was, I partially paid for it. My grandmother helped me. She, she was my semi enabler of the group. She took care of me at all costs. Yeah. I pull up and I go to sell this kid drugs. And he's like, come on, just give it to me. And I was like, bro, give me the fucking money. You know how this works. I'm not giving you shit until you give me the fucking money. And he's like, no, no, no. I want to run inside and put it on the scale. I was like, yo, give me the fucking money or I'm leaving. You know how this goes down. And he goes, you think I have to fucking beat you? And he pulls out a, a wad of cash, starts counting. He's got a big gold chain on a wife beater, classic, like street shit, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Red solo cup. And I'm like, ah, whatever. Fuck it, bro. I have my boys with me. He was by himself. So I put it in his hand. And he goes, you're fucking beat. Fucking do something about it. And he walks out. I can't, I can't tell you the amount of times I, I went above and beyond when somebody tried to beat me are not in this book. I've jumped on the hood of moving cars and been driven down the street at six. Jeez. You don't fucking beat me, bro. I, yo, I, I, there is one story where kids try to do it and I jumped on the side of the car and they sped away and jerked the wheel and I flew off into the street. I lost skin up, down my whole body. Oh, I don't want to get beat. When, when you, you get beat in the drug game, you're a fucking bitch. What do you mean get beat? Like, you don't want to get your product get stolen. Yeah. Okay, okay. So he's, so, I was a psycho, bro. You know what I'm saying, man. So he's, like, fuck, <laughs> so he's like, fuck you, you're fucking beat. Bro, the second he turned around, my door was already open and I was on the way behind him. So he starts moving quick and I'm walking up behind him and I go to, to literally go throw a punch at the back of his head and I step into like a little hole in the driveway, it's like, it's, but there's like an overhang of cement. So my foot kind of locks in yeah, there. Yeah. And his boy that I didn't know was on the side of the house waiting for all this to go down comes and fucking drills me from the side. Uh, I mean, absolutely fucking drills me. And I just hear. Uh, and so then the shock sets in. Cause I've been through this scenario 15,000 times with shit that shouldn't be happening. happening. <laughs> so you go into military mode. So I start to assess it now. And by the way, now I'm on the ground. My, I, I look, first thing I look down, I see my foot is 180, completely hanging off sideways. Uh, uh. Skin broken, bone piercing the skin. Crown pound fracture, horrifying. <sighs> now I look up and there's fists coming at my oh. face. Fists, 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 over and over. So I'm just getting fucked up. My legs hanging off. The neighbors are outside. There's heroin on the ground. There's cash all over the place. My boys get out of the car, out of the backseat of the Infinity, run over, and they beat the fuck out of the two kids. My boy, I'm not going to even say their names. One of them chokes him out. We get the product back. We, I G.I. Joe crawl back to my passenger seat and pull myself into the car, uh. and we fucking speed off, okay? So now we're in, we're, in, we're in West Haven. We're speeding down the street. I also had, for some reason, brought a shit ton of product with me to the deal. So I had a whole bunch of shit on me. We had to go stop and drop it back off in my boy's sock drawer, so we stopped there. Now, keep in mind. This is the majority of people are like, yo, ambulance, fit, uh, get to the hospital. Yeah. I have to go drop drugs off first. I don't oh have, I can't, God. I can't go to the hospital. I can't risk it. So we go, we drop the shit off. We drop everything in the, in the house and he's driving. And every time he fucking, he doesn't drive stick. So every time he puts it in second, eh, my foot oh. bad, oh. bad. He don't know how to operate the clutch. Bad. Rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. So we get to the we get to the I-95, which is a you know infamous part of my story. And everybody on the East Coast, shout out East Coast, I-95, knows what I'm talking about. We get on I-95, we go to we go to the ramp and we're about to go to Milford Hospital. We're gonna drive from West Haven to Milford. We get to the ramp, I see the light, I'm like, we're home free. Every single fucking ordinance at the same time. Major crimes unit, narcotics team, the dogs, every fucking buddy, uniform cop, undercover detectives, everybody converges on us at the same time as we're about to turn on the ramp. Middle of the road, they're directing cars around us. I'm sitting there like this with my hands in the air, my foot hanging off of my body. My other boys are already face down in the middle of the street handcuffed with a 20 year old cop with that fucking gun. Get the fuck out of the fucking car. 
screaming. Now I'm sitting there like a child at this point. At slow mo, you know that you you know that like yeah. I, I, you can ideate ideate that feeling, right? Slow mo, officer, I can look in my le- I don't give a fuck if you have a leg. Get out of the fucking car. So I have to then with my arm pull myself and throw myself onto the concrete where I stayed for two hours as they searched my car for guns because the neighbors who called the cops said that there was an armed robbery with handguns. Uh. They propped my foot up on my golf bag with my golf clubs in it that I probably should. I probably was playing golf with my dad the weekend earlier in some, some trying to have a normal life, some semblance of a normal life. And I sat there and they, they searched the car. They did, luckily they didn't find anything cause I, they found like a couple empty bags. It wasn't a big deal, but then they brought me to the hospital and that was just another, they, oh yeah. Side note. They threw fucking two plates, 20 screws into my ankle. Yeah. I'm bionic <laughs> on that ankle. Iron and, Man. and that, and that injury, even with the splenectomy, the hernia, the fractured skull, all the concussions, all the car accidents that day in 2008 and that injury has the biggest effect on my life that the uh, you, you'll probably show pictures of this. But after I got clean, I became, I was 300 pounds. That's funny. You say I have it right pulled up. There's the ankle right there. Yep. This was this was drug Mike. I'm so glad I don't know this person. The, the car above it is that G35. No. Why is it like this, Mike? Why is there a, a tree in the engine, Mike? Because a couple months after that, I drove it off a cliff. Jesus Christ. <laughs> off a cliff. <laughs> bro, 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 bro. Okay, so here's what I'm saying. Like, you're my boy. I've I've heard hundreds of these stories. Like, they just, it's just one after the other, yeah. which is insane. And one part of that story um, that the audience may have missed is that before the cops pulled you over, you said you dropped off the product and yeah, you had yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. If yeah. you had not have dropped off the product, wouldn't be here. How many years in jail would you have been serving? That that was that was probably the second or third most I've, product I've ever had on me for a stop because there was one time where that's also in the story where I had um, for anybody who hustles, I had thirty five bundles on me, which is about three hundred and fifty bags of heroin, and. Uh, I was already on a five year suspended sentence in the state of Connecticut, meaning a jaywalking ticket or a jaywalking misdemeanor or any kind of misdemeanor. I would have gone and done 50 to 80 percent of my five year term without a charge, yeah. without a new charge. I probably based on like that amount or like even a few grams of heroin probably would have got like 10, 10 plus years. I, I refer to Mike as the walking miracle because the amount of times he should have died or gone to prison is absolutely insane. It's unlike any story I've seen in 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 movies, which is why I think this will be a phenomenal movie. <laughs> and I and I want to play you. Yeah, you should. That'd be amazing. Oh That'd be amazing. I'll, I'll get I'll get up to three hundred for sure. But yeah, dude, like three. This is why he's called Hey Big Mike, by the way, because I asked him. I was like, Hey, why is your Instagram handle Big Mike? Like, you're not that big, right? He goes, Oh, you don't know. <laughs> I used to be three hundred pounds. And, and it's so fun. And it's so funny because. Like every one of those little like tenants and those little stories, I want to talk to that sufferer about it. Cause like, think about it. There are people who put out entire books about weight loss. I did that whole fucking thing. <laughs> I did that whole fucking thing, went through the same thing, but that's just one little part of it. People want to do mental illness. You've seen me sweat. You've seen me sweat. You know, I wake up with fucking bone chilling anxiety every single day and deal with depression and all that shit every single day. And I got coping mechanisms and I could tell that story. I do that story. Hmm. The drug addiction, the divorce, p- parents beating the fuck out of each other. Like I've had all of that happen. And so I tried to put a little bit of all of it. And most importantly, the action steps into this book. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to talk about yeah, next yeah, yeah, because. Yeah. We could, uh, we could literally go so far down the rabbit hole of like yeah, yeah. fucked up shit that's happened in your past. But yeah. the the important thing, and this is maybe why even we're such good friends, is is the, the comeback, the bounce back, the redemption. Yeah. is the word you like. Redemption. It's my favorite word in the entire world. Why? It might be the only, it might be the only tattoo that I ever get. <laughs> it's the most important word to me. I oh, I have been obsessed with that word since since the two thousands. When I listen, Logan Paul gave me a platform. Lana Rhodes has given me a ton more views. I've had it. 
whatever you want to call it since the day I was fucking born, dude. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to say it is. I was in the gifted program from fourth grade until high school. Yo, your son has an aptitude that is way above fucking average. Well, you know what's so funny? You sent us the group chat, one of the report card yeah, yeah, from, yeah. from like when he was six <laughs> years old. So funny. And the comment was that the teacher left was like, very smart kid uh, tends to talk out of out of place. <laughs> I was like, right. since the day I was, I was like, fucking born. Nothing's changed. Since the day I was born. <laughs> but yeah, I always knew I had it, but but the 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 biggest story there is no matter how smart you are. No matter how well trained or how well versed you are in this life, your card could get pulled at any time, yep. at any fucking time. You are not invincible. And I wasn't, and I wasn't, I fell victim slightly, whether you want to call it choice, you want to call it disease, whatever you want to call it. I fell into a hole a bet, and mine was bad. It was bad as you could tell. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I think the biggest thing that comes out of that, that choice, uh, choice versus disease story that I told earlier, yep. whether you think the addict down the street from you or that lives in your house or your family member or whatever chose to do it, or it was the addiction that did it to them. My question is this, does it, does it matter? Does it matter what, what the reason was the biggest, most important thing is these are people. I was a person. I didn't believe it anymore. I didn't believe it anymore. To, to, I, was, I was nothing. I was, I was primed and ready for a casket. That was my fucking destiny, was to die a heroin addict. But because people said, yo, you have something in you. My mom said, I, I still fucking love you. As hard, as hard as it was for her to say that. Those are the things that got me through. And the most painful thing for me always is imagining the lonely addicts out there imagining the vietnam vets imagining the 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 iraq iraqi freedom vets that are living under fucking bridges in this country right now addicted to drugs with no one with no one to put a hand on their shoulder and say yo it's going to be good keep putting your foot in front of the other one in front of the other keep going keep pushing forward that's the entire story of this book the very first page, the, 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 the dedication, whatever you want to call it for this book is this book is dedicated to those who struggle. Do not let your light go out. That is my, that is the message of this book. My light got so dim to a point where it was just a few people left holding this match at the end of a fucking 500 mile tunnel that I knew I was, I thought, and I knew I would never make it to the end of, but I, but still nonetheless, that little fucking light dude was the only thing that kept me going, was the only thing that kept me going. And if that light goes out, it's over. So you have to find what that light is for you. You have to find what is that one thing that will keep you going when everything else fails. What was it for you? For me, it was, for me, it was my mom. A hundred percent. It was also my addiction to to what I've told you guys, which is uh, which is my addiction to legacy and wanting to leave something on this planet before I die. That stayed with me through my entire addiction, no matter how bad it got. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I don't want to. I don't know if I want to give this away. Actually, don't. there was one. There was one thing that happened at my worst moment that that quite literally saved my life. And 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 was <laughs> once again, it's another moment of of somebody pulling your card. Like, it's like, it's like, it's so funny in this world that everybody has some level of like, no matter where they are, they get like some level of ego where they're like, yeah, like they have that feeling of invincibility. And then just, yo, know, just knowing that someone can quite literally pull the floor is this, out. Is this from the thing that, that I, that is it, is this the pivot point? Yeah. You, I think, you know, it was, it was something a person did. Yes. Yeah. It, it's this moment's fascinating for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask <laughs> you about just it. Talk? We can, nah, we can nah, it. Nah, 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 I want to <laughs> save it, but it's. Why it's fascinating for me is is because of how 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 quickly oh, all of it changed. It makes no sense I to know. me. But I want to save it for the book. Yeah. Gotcha. Can I read an excerpt yeah, yeah, that you course. provided me with yeah, that I think fits well here? Sure. I tell myself every day, you will not give up in the face of adversity. You will look every obstacle, every hurdle, every demon in its face. You will lower your shoulders and drive through that motherfucker without hesitation or regret. I believe that's what separates those who make it from those who don't. 
This is the mentality that got me through the most horrific, life-draining days of my addiction, and it is the same mentality that pushes me through every single moment I face today in my new career in this new LA. I tell myself that if I'm able to let this mentality seep into every cell of my body, I can never lose. And this goes for anyone and everyone. That I know for sure. Okay. Don't take this personally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love when you say that. In my mind, <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't picture you as like a fighter, like physically. Right. You know? Yeah. Like a or a, a competitor. Right. But what you're describing here is a warrior fucking mentality. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. So for people who are like me, bro, uh, strip me down, primal, I'm going to beat the sh fucking shit out of you, <laughs> yeah. bro. I, like when I was dying on the bathroom floor because the hot shit, Mac yeah. used the word fight. And I was like, yeah. I was I was dying. I was like, oh, you fuck you. I'm going to fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> so where do you, how can you be the warrior when, again, don't take this personally, like you, you, you aren't a inherent physical warrior. Yeah. The warrior manifests itself in so many ways, in so many ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's never, it's, you know, just the, the alpha fighter. That's mm -hmm. just one physical aspect mm -hmm. of the warrior. Mm -hmm. The warrior is the, 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 the biggest thing, the biggest thing and, and attribute of the warrior has nothing to do with how they look, the style of their fight. It's the fact that no matter what fucking happens, they will not give up. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. Bro, I have been to a point where there were two of you pummeling me in the fucking head while I was completely done on the ground. And, there, and everything in me kept fucking clawing, grab legs, punch, block, throw. Yeah. I will not fucking go down. Do you, do you, to a human, to substance, to anything, bro. I will fucking fight. It's not that I won't go down, but I will do everything in my power not to. And now that's as now that manifests itself in, yo, you're going on MTV tomorrow, and you have anxiety, and you have to sit in front of 400 people, and as you walk through that curtain into that audience onto that stage, you know you are going to break down. You fucking know it. I knew it. I knew it 100% without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to break down. The question then becomes, will you keep going afterwards? Will you stay in the fucking game or will you run away? I wrote it in this fucking book. Chapter two, what episode one, impulsive nerves going crazy. Easiest thing to do. Yo, Logan, I have a mental illness. I have a problem. I can't do this show with you. I didn't do that. I sat here and I fucking dealt with it, dude. And I faced down my problem and I was victorious over it. It wasn't pretty, but it gets better every fucking day. Every day you step face to face with your fucking demons and you say, yo, you will not take me down. I will fucking beat you is a day closer to being free of those fucking demons, bro. I, I have a question about that. I, I, honest, honest answer. How much of that would you attribute to pride? That's a fucking great question. That's a great question. Because I've seen, because I've seen it come from the place you're describing, and I've also seen it come from a place of pride that isn't always the smartest. I mean, you're human. We we are, we're all like this. But when you're getting beat up by two dudes, I picture you, like I know you. I could be wrong, but I picture you like still cussing at that, like motor mouth Mike. Like <laughs> that was me. Oh, fuck, get Bro, the fuck I, I used to, fucking pussies. Like yeah. getting the that, shit kicked out of you. I did that exact speech you just said. With a loaded handgun in my mouth. Up to my fucking teeth in Bridgeport, Connecticut. What are you, what are you talking about, Mike? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking Chapter about? One. No, wait, wait, actually, no, it might be further. Jeez, we owed a shit ton. Okay, actually, let me let me re, let me rephrase that because the because the staring down a barrel thing has happened to me a lot of times. And I don't uh. wanna and I don't wanna sound too tough here because I've because because you're, you're a simp now. No. Here's, here's why. Here's why. Yeah. There was probably just less than 10 times that it happened. That's probably oh. less than 10 times too many, guys. Yes. Five of those were white friends of mine or, or kids that I sold to that I said slightly out of pride, slightly out of ego, slightly out of not caring yeah. about my life at that time. It was always, give me everything you have. Give me the oxys. Give me the money. In Milford, <laughs> my answer was, fuck you, pussy. Pull the fucking trigger. Oh, no. Every fucking time. When I got to the big leagues and I was in Bridgeport and it was 
I'm not saying names on this one. Names have been changed in the book. You owe ten thousand dollars to our organization. That now I'm actually watching him say so a guy say this to my plug. You owe ten thousand dollars to our organization. If we don't have it by next week, we are going to kill everyone in this fucking house. <sighs> week later, we don't have the money because we had picked up from other connects. Burnt like it was. This was during a very desperate time. Same guy comes in. Black. This is the thing. People see movies, people watch this shit happen in music videos. Seeing it in real life is a vastly different situation. <laughs> I've talked to you about about uh, armchair generals yes, before. Yes. When you see that guy who you know has bodies, bro, I knew that this this dude was the baddest man I'd ever fucking met. He was a bulldog sent by people to make sure we they were paid. When he rolled in this one day, black hoodie, black hat, black mechanical mechanics gloves, black jeans and black boots with a hand that did not leave his hoodie pocket. I knew we were in fucking trouble. Walks through the back door. He had just given us the the warning exactly a week earlier. Where's the fucking money? The second my connect said we're working on it, pistol to the face so fucking hard. Blood splattered on the fucking wall, oh. on the wall in front of me. Dude falls to the ground and he pummeled his fucking face with a nine millimeter for, for minutes until I finally stood up and said, yo, please stop beating him. You're going to fucking kill him right now. You're going to kill him in front of me on the floor. There's two girls with me. I was, we were sitting on his bed in a fucking trap house basement in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I walked up and I said, please, I put my hands together like this. And he put the gun in my fucking face. And every other time I had said, fuck you, pussy, pull the trigger, <laughs> was gone out the fucking window. And I said nothing. And I stood there like this. And that is how a lot of people have gone out, standing there silently as someone decides their fate. And, and honestly, like, shit, like if I had, I, we had guns, we had guns. But it's like, dude, that, that situation of like, yo, are you really about to start a, ter- a fucking war right now? Is a big deal. This wasn't an intruder. This was someone who was coming representing an organization of people who it would have turned into a bloodbath for everyone. And within that happened, things continued to deteriorate. I stopped going. And about two months later, the DEA raided that facility, his other plugs facility, the restaurant they bought with drug money. He did nine and a half years in a federal penitentiary. Your plug or the, the, the pistol the whipper? Plug. Pistol whipper, I don't believe was ever found to be, to got in trouble for him. I'm sure he did after that. But. Yo, it's crazy how I've heard these stories before. And when you tell them, and by the way, you're doing a great job. This is probably some of the best renditions I've heard. I'm fired up. No, yeah, you, you're killing it, bro. Oh, really quick, you know what they called me? I got a pass for a little while in Bridgeport, at least. I was White Mike. That was me. I was White Mike. Yo, White Mike, what's good? Why aren't you hate White Mike? I should. I could have. I think think Big Mike was better. But I got, because there's a lot of people watching this, bro. This is another huge thing. There's a lot of people watching this. are like, this simp? This guy. No, that's what I'm saying. This fucking kid? No, that's what I'm saying. There's There's a lot to Mike. There's a lot to Mike's past that... You'll hear him say like, yo, I used to be addicted to drugs and drugs and you don't know the weight that that sentence holds. And you're, you're, you're funny. You're funny. You're the funny guy. Right. right so it's right. hard to believe that these things happened. And uh, it's all, and it's all 100% accurate. Yep, like it's yeah. all 100% accurate. It's all really happened. There's some account of every piece of it. And also like, it didn't always go that way. Like I, I, I it's crazy to imagine. I, I always wanted to talk to you about fighting, but dude, I did the street. I did a ton of fucking fighting. I did a ton of fucking fighting, and I lost some, and I won some. Yeah, there was a. I I, I believe you. I just like only know the mic that (laughs) can't go above like say five thousand, six thousand feet elevation. (laughs) Like like, hobbles when he walks. It's the ankle. I'm telling you, you take care of this. If I take care of this ankle, which I will do, I have to get what's called fusion. Mm -hmm. This is an exciting, another exciting semi story. Fusion. They will go into my ankle. They will remove my plates and my screws from my ankle. But while they're there, they'll also remove my ankle joint completely. Oh, they'll oh, take it out of out of it. my leg completely. Oh, don't need it. And they will then fuse my leg bone oh. to my foot bone in what looks like a right angle. How the <laughs> fuck is that going to make it better? Because the pain that exists in it, which is the reason why I limp or hobble or whatever you want to call it, is the arthritis that exists above and below the joint. Okay. There is zero cartilage. Uh, There's zero cartilage left in my ankle. And so when my bone... D- D- Danny, show Danny really quick. What do you want me to do? I just, if he gets an amputated, he can run. She wants me to cut it off. Oh, she wants me oh, to that's just right. cut oh, no. my entire foot off and put a, uh, 
a, a prosthetic. It's bold. A prosthetic, yeah. Bold. That's like futuristic. That's pretty yeah. futuristic. It might not be, might not be there yet. Yeah. Um, but I'll get there, bro. That's, so that's that's future Mike. What about like present day Mike? I got some questions for present day Mike. Yeah, sure. How has writing all of your you talked about battling your demons? How has writing out all of your um, past horrors and insurrections and all these things fixed not fixed but affected your mental state of today? Um. Well, from a macro angle, it, it helped immensely because I've always told you that I cared so much about my story mm-hmm. and making sure that it was told and 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 I cared about that until. I cared about it a little bit or a decent amount until I started to get the feedback from people. Once I started to see that it was resonating with people and people actually were taking the story seriously and being like, yo, like this, this story changed my life. Like once you hear that, there's no going back from that. There's no, okay, actually I don't want to tell this story. I don't want people to know that I did heroin. I don't want people to know that I fucking did these things to my mom or my grandfather. Once a, once a fucking 17 year old kid tells me that I stopped make he stopped doing pills because of this or stopped whatever it's over for me bro that's that's how i'm built i now this this right here this book and this new light lane of life for me is the payback this is how i make things right this is how i make things right and i probably still can't ever and i'll still have regrets and i'll still have sorrow and i'll still feel terrible about the fucking things that i did when i was younger and desperate and stupid and fucking wild but this is this is it this is how i get this is what how i help this is how i take my the opportunity that i've been given through the million fucking micro calculations that i've made since i got clean and give that back and make it better i have a question yeah do i have to take it personal no okay (laughs) actually yeah maybe (laughs) why the fuck did Sean from Love Sack <laughs> hire a guy who just got off a 10 year bender on drugs? Sean Nelson from Love Sack. What a fucking guy, dude. Cause like I I I think, you know, I go, people ask me, like, yo, what about Mike? I was like, oh, I love the kid, saw something special in him. Then he like I gave him uh the tools, he built the house. But Sean's <laughs> risk was a lot higher because you weren't even like a uh, promising young lad at that point. You were just, dog walker. Dog walker. <laughs> dog walker. This is the thing. This is this dog is the main walker. part of the story. This is the main part of the story. That was not that long ago. You can do this if you're watching this and you're and you're like, yo, if I get clean tomorrow, Mike, I'm just at zero again. I'm just at the same level as everybody else. Actually, I'm still negative because when I got clean and I walked out of rehab, I walked out of rehab with a 400 credit score. Up to my eyes in fucking debt because all I had was a computer that I would pawn, unpawn, pawn, unpawn. At that point, it was so bad. I didn't see. I didn't know this. Every, uh, every I didn't know this, and that, this is why you are so uh, <laughs> worried oh, about saving all, money. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please, I don't want to end up in a place where I need to pawn my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I try to save all my money, but like when you walk out and and all of your friends that you went to high school with, they're married and they work for Dell and they have four hundred one k and they have stock options, and your mom's driving you to NA meetings. And you're 26 or mm. you're 30 or you're 34. Mm. And you've never once had any idea about what to do in this on this spinning rock. Bro, this is crazy. This is fucking crazy. That, that, dude. That, that, <laughs> that was me. That was me, bro. Oh my God. At, 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 all the way up until probably 20, 29, 29 years old. Jeez. I I here's what I will say to people watching this that have no clue. That, that have no clue what they want to do, how they want to do it. Because I was there. I was just there. It was a store. I was just there. I was just at it. Let me give you something. I started trying things. I, start, I, knew, I knew I had something and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know I wanted to be a YouTuber. I didn't have the luxury of, of knowing what it was. But I knew I had something. And let me tell you this. Tell if my- you've made it through addiction or mental illness... You have something because a lot of people don't. If you are still kicking today, battling those demons, you have something because a lot of people didn't wake up today because they couldn't make it. They couldn't cut it and you fucking did. So you have something, but you might not know what it is. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot, bro. I can't imagine. I can't imagine just overcoming that hurdle of drug addiction and looking around going, holy shit. 
what the fuck do I do? I, I hate to say this and I am cautious with it, but I'm going to fucking say it. Don't take it as a direct comparison, please. But there are people that come home from war. They come home and they have nothing. Yeah. The VA turns their back yeah, on them. Yeah. Their family says, welcome back. You're back. Have fun. Veterans are dealing with it every day. Yeah. Not a direct comparison, but let me tell you how I felt. I walked out of rehab. I had nothing. I had nothing. No education, no fucking car, nothing. I was 26 years old with not a, a anything. And I and I started doing shit. Started walking those dogs. I started for, for, so first. I my sister said, "Hey, listen, you know, we could you could be a you could pick up dog shit." Which I didn't sister? say. Uh, my Which older sister? Jill. Jill? Jill. Jill is a very important part of my story. I've not, I don't think I've told you a lot about this, but my older sister was uh, like another mom to me. Oh. She 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 loved me so dearly, and when she saw me start to get my things together, she activated hard, bro. Took me in, was like another mom, literally, and said, "Yo." Pick up this dog shit. And and a part of me was like, pick up dog shit. You know how much fucking shit I sold the pet? Like, fuck that shit. No. And I, but I did it. Yeah. And then it and then it went to running an entire camp for dogs, which is in this story, but is hilarious. <laughs> I wish we should, I wish we had a picture of me with 30 dogs <laughs> in the backyard, all different breeds. And I would make sure the pits didn't kill the fucking German shepherds. And I would, <laughs> I would hang out with I would hang out all day with Bailey and Harper and Snowflake and all my good friends. They were all dogs, others, no other people <laughs> just me, with a bunch of dogs. I did that for a while, but then I started picking up side things. I said, I like photos. I like, I think I can take photos. They're fun to do. That's fun. I saved up a little bit of money with my shitty job and my non-existence. And I had no friends because I had to write them all off because I wanted to get clean and stay clean. And I had no one, but I had a camera now. And so somebody said, whoa, what do you shoot with that, that Canon 70D that you bought? I said, I'm a wedding photographer. <laughs> and I said, you're a wedding photographer? And I was like, yeah, that's right. I'm a wedding photographer. I had never even seen a wedding in my life at that point. It, I was 30 years old when I saw my first wedding. I'd never seen a fucking wedding in my life. Damn. I said, I'm a wedding photographer. They were like, well, it's, I, I know someone who's about to get married. Should I see she's on a budget. And they were like, well, what's, I was like, well, how does that work? And they're like, oh, I, I don't know. Go talk to her. So talk to her. They're like, oh, I'll give you 750 bucks. You're a wedding photographer. I was like, yeah, I'm a wedding photographer. Showed up at a wedding with a 70D and a fucking built-in flash. A built-in flash. <laughs> and took pictures of the bride and the, and the groomsmen. I took that money and I bought a DJI drone. Phantom One. And they said, what do you do with that drone, Mike? I said, I fly down the aisle behind the bride as she walks down the aisle. <laughs> and I was one of the first people no. to fly a drone over weddings. And I put it on YouTube and I'd send them. I was like, but that's 2500 And so I started doing that. But then this is where calculations come in and you have to and you have to calculate that business grew to a point where i was making more money than the dog walking but how long would it last so i waited and after six months went by of making more money than the dog walking, I said no more dog walking hmm. and then it was photos and then it was drones and then i started writing and i met somebody who was like yo you took great pictures at this wedding want to try writing and so i wrote something for aol and then one day I see an ad in, on Craigslist for a company called Lovesack that sells beanbag chairs. And it said, personal assistant needed. And I was like, and it was like to grow my social media. And, and by the way, it was like 2012. Nobody knew how to grow social media except me because except I was an expert in the social media growth and branding world. Ah. At least that's what I said. <laughs> I, I had no idea. Yeah. I got on the phone. So I, so I, I apply. He calls me. One day I'm sitting at Subway. This is the whole story's in there. Sitting at Subway with my boy Pat. Patsy, shout out Patsy. Patsy, shout Jack out Milford, Patsy. You, you know, you've talked Can't wait to meet Patsy. Um, me and him had, had fallen into a dark pit of uh, day trading. Some penny stocks. We thought because by the way, I was a great penny trader. You may not believe it, but I've done it. I've tried everything. Yo. I get a call. He's like, hey, uh, Mike, this is Sean from Love Sack. And I was like, okay. He's like, yeah, I got your resume. He's like, you seem to be an expert in branding and uh, and social media growth. I was like, that's right. He's like, what do you say you come in for a meeting next week in Stanford, Connecticut? And I was like, all right, yeah, be there. Next week rolls around, throw on my one button down that I have. I got a Pico at Marshall's for 29 bucks. I rolled into this place. It's like some fancy restaurant because Stanford's like the up upgraded like Connecticut, part of Connecticut. And I sit down, I have a conversation with him. And in that first conversation, he saw something. He saw something. He said, 
I don't, he said it to me day one. I don't know what it is, but like something about you, like there's something there. Uh-huh. There's something there. Like you, you, you got it. Yeah. You know how to talk. Yeah. You know, how, you, you got that spunk. Yep. I started working for him. And one day I told him, I said, Hey, listen, man, um, I haven't been completely honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Not only that, but I'm also a felon narcotics addict dealer. I have a horrible past. I'm so sorry. I never told you. <laughs> the way Sean was brought up and the way Sean's religion goes and the way he is as a person is to forgive and to give people a chance. Mormons. He's a Mormon. Yep. Sean's a devout Mormon. Yep. Mormon. He gave me a chance. That chance led to a text message between myself and the Logan Paul who wanted some beanbag chairs for Yo, 16, this story is so fucking for 60, weird, for Mike. For 1600 Vine. Mike, your life is so weird, dude. Yeah. This is hitting me this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Bro, this makes no sense, Mike. <laughs> this makes no sense. Because even like when you were writing this book, how did you plan to do anything with what the things you were writing? Because now you have a platform. You're dating one of the biggest female adult, ex-adult film stars in the world with a massive online presence. Your best friend is the same shit. And now you are too. <laughs> Do, do, wow. Do, okay. All right, I'll go from here. Do you see why I need to give back? And why I have to give back? Bro? Yeah. This is this is crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I'm trying to like take away why why how because I I I would like to believe there's a how. I'm sure you you uh, attribute a lot to your religion and your faith, and 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 and, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's like the universe. Uh, I don't. It's it's almost like for every action is an equal and opposite reaction and because of how low you were now you have the opportunity to get as high as you can be and that fucking love stack bro i heard about these giant bean bags i'm like i, I want one so i walk into the love stacks love stack store where in sherman oaks? sherman oaks sherman oaks i'm like hey i do vine's social media presence like you mind hitting uh contact hitting me up or you mind linking me with the uh, the, marketing the, market, the marketing guy Get a text from a dude named Mike. He's like, "Yo, you, do you have any ideas?" I was like, "Yeah, I, I kind of don't want to pay for this, this this love sack. Is there anything we can do?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure, we can work on it." Super amicable, friendly, charismatic guy. I told the story a thousand times. Got my love sack, set him up. I was like, "Bro, these are great. Can you fuck on him?" Because you were being friendly and fun and like a bro. He goes. As a matter of fact, you can. Logan, <laughs> the covers are machine washable, so come wherever you like. I was like, this guy's great. And then the way our friendship developed is, uh, it's one for the books. That's a whole nother it's podcast. It's one for the books, it's, bro. Is it in the book? The whole thing, bro. Listen, we, we became really good friends over text at first, and then, yeah, we could do a whole show on this. And By the way, you, you fucker's going to read this before I do. He doesn't have one actual copy, copy of the book, and this is just a mock-up <laughs> copy. <laughs> But we uh, first time we met in, in real life, Travis Strana's house put yeah. together this this amazing uh, 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 deal where he actually. It's so funny how these one these days are just tiny blips in the story. Like he shot a love sack out of a massive room size slingshot yeah. and tried to knock Travis Pastrana out of the sky as he jumped off a large ramp on a motocross yeah. bike while Roman Atwood recorded. Yeah. What the fuck did I just say? What the fuck did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? And, and I met you for the first time. You came down the driveway and you're like, Mike! And I turned around and I said, yo! And j- just like that, bro. So uh, when I'm going to fast, I'm going to fast forward a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Uh, because when you really became a part of this shit, and by the way, I'm so sorry for bringing you onto this. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened, bro. Was after Tokyo. Yeah. Whole chapter about that. Yep. So, um, we have been friends for a while and I, I saw the thing too in you. I just wasn't sure where, where to, uh, devote that energy. And you, you, you had always cared about me and my well being and my career and um, I don't know if I want to read the excerpt because uh, it even for me brings up some uh, some some demons and feelings that make me a little un- uncomfortable. I read it before the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm yeah. <laughs> this yeah, it's, no, it just hits a little too close to home for me to read. Yeah, for sure. But uh, why why did you why did you come into my life and help me? <laughs> Why, why did you leave your... I make jokes about this all the time. Even... I wrote that thing. I want to read it. Which one? 
My my uh oh your letter for the book yes find it right now I'll I'll, I'll give you some somewhat of an answer. Uh, what's a, what's a what's a keyword that I used? Corporate. I use corporate. I'm searching my notes. I can send it to you right now. Got well. it. That's how you, that's how you find notes that you took a while ago. That was do do uh, do words that you know you used. I found our, our found your machine washable text by typing in washable because nice. I know no one's going to use that. Yeah. Except when I clicked on it because I was going to take a screenshot. It was too far back. It was lost in the ether of text messages. But Mike asked me to write like a forward or something, something a prelude for his book. It's like a little teaser, and I put. I met Mike when he was selling beanbags. As a social media kid trying to get free furniture, I had no idea that the marketing manager that I was texting would soon become my best friend, business partner, and roommate. See, most people fall in love with Mike's charisma and deceptive intelligence, but not me. I liked Mike because he was able to get me free free beanbags. (laughs) However, as he continued to supply me with shredded memory foam stuffed inside a sack, I realized that the kid had real spunk. As a spunkster myself, I enjoyed every second chopping it up with Mike. Conversations were effort, jovial, pragmatic. It was a blossoming love story akin to Brokeback Mountain without the gay sex. <laughs> Soon thereafter, I rescued Mike from his stable, secure, and lucrative corporate job in Connecticut <laughs> and brought him permanently into my fucked up life that is digital media. He quickly became the big brother I never had and never wanted. <laughs> There's many things I like about Mike. His ability to navigate through the shitstorm and come out victorious. His inter- interpersonal communication skills. His humor. I've been lucky enough to experience the ripple effects of his unmatched energetic glow as he continues to make me the best version of myself. Mike is an invaluable and irreplaceable counterpart, but he's also a pussy. LP. <laughs> so I'm here to ask you why the fuck you left your job in Connecticut to join this bullshit and help me overcome a lot of hurdles in my life. Because I was not in a good place. As much as I like to pretend that I was, I was not. And that's why I can't even read that passage out loud. Because I, 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 I cannot, I cannot for the life of me, identify what I was thinking. If someone were to ask me during that time, why, why, why did you do this? I used to answer that question. Yeah. I used to, I, I used to go, man, it's, it's hard to say, but I imagine the, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know the answer now. So, right. so again, I'll ask you for a third time and let you speak this time. <laughs> Why, Mike? No matter how bad my life got <clears throat> when I was doing the things that I was doing, there was always an, uh, a part of me that was filled with intense love and passion for other people. It, it that was one thing that never went away. It never went away. Even e- even though I did things that counteracted that and contradicted that all the time, I and and out of out of self-preservation and desperation. I did horrible things, but I always had that part of me that just loved people. I truly, truly, truly love people. I love being friends with people. I love making their lives better that there's nothing that makes me feel better than that. And I'm, I've always been very good at it. I've always been good at helping people, giving advice to people, walking people through tough times. When I first met you and we became friends, it, it was a very noisy part of your life. There was a lot of people involved. A lot of people. Some were great. Some were very fucking bad. When I came in, the one thing I knew for certain was which one of those people I was. And there was debate about it. There was debate from family members about it. There was debate about business people about it the whole time. But I knew more than anyone that the only reason I was doing the shit I was doing was because I, I loved, I already loved you and you were already a very good friend of mine. I wanted you to get through whatever it was, whether it was the good or the bad. We were supposed to start working together and we were supposed to be counterparts prior to Tokyo. We were working on that. There was going to be this massive influencer arm of the Maverick business and I was going to take it over and I was already meeting with Jeff. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a good spot, just benchmark, to yeah. say that you were never meant to be talent. You were meant to Absolutely be not. the head business of talent. Side. Yes, The head of talent, of, of marketing, of yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then, as we know is in this book, a part that you don't want to read, and I can completely understand that, one of the most earth-shattering fucking moments happened. Yeah. And it was earth-shattering for me because it was my next step in life. And so when it when it happened to him, it happened to me too. Mm. And not, not more than a, a, a month or so after that, there was a follow-up, which demonetized your channel and created more havoc for you. Yeah, the rat. Which which was the rat. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know this, but I went bonkers. You went apeshit. I went apeshit on everybody. Your fan on everybody. The, I, the, I'll give you some context here. Yeah, so yeah, after yeah. Tokyo happened, uh, I did the 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 rat thing. Fuck. Ugh. <laughs> I didn't send it to the review team that we had just put in place because Mike said to. Mm-hmm. I, 
it's one of the most uh, picture perfect definitions of self sabotage. Just yeah. like like I, I I didn't show the people who were put around me because I was being a fuck ass, a villain. Yeah. Um, and you got so mad. You got so, so mad. I remember being on the flight from JFK and I was still on the runway to leave JFK to come back here because I was coming back here so often at that point. But I was still going back to Love Psych. I was trying yep. to balance yep. it. And I was, I was fucking fuming. You motherfuckers. You did it again, Jeff. The other people that were on the team <laughs> I won't mention at this time that were part of the team and everybody didn't yell much at you, but I probably did. But that's a, you, and, you and, did, you did. But but anyways, that was a that was like as I started to transition into the team. But the one thing that was always there was the belief that I was doing all of this because I genuinely cared about you as a person, and that was the reason. And and there was never there was always a uh, you always you you still to this day have this filter. Yeah, you know, what why is this person doing this? You knew early that I was that I was a good mm-hmm, person. Mm-hmm. You knew, you just knew. And that's why I, we still, we, it, it's, this is not in the book. So I guess there are a couple of things. Talk about, talk about the shrimp. The gar- no, not the shrimp, oh. but sim- <laughs> similarly, the garage night where it ha- the first time where it went yeah, down, yeah. The, one of the worst times yep. with the entire, with everybody. And we don't have to name names or anything, but you stood up to your own family members in my defense. It's about to throw hands. About to throw hands in a, in a fight that almost went down. And, and, um, I've, oh, I, can say without question, without any thought whatsoever, that I am a good person. I know that I was raised a good person. My mother hasn't put that in me. My grandmother, my father, everything about me, not everything. I have some down, some pitfalls, but at heart, I am a good person. And that is why I ended, that is why I said, to, to your point, I know it's funny, but. Th- I knew that if I walked away from everything during a point that was not your best or brightest, it was going to work out. Mm. And I'm, and I'm happy I did. And it was, and it was, and it was fucking horrible for a while. (laughs) Even with the, um, (laughs) even with the, the the shrimp thing, like when Mike and I broke up for a week, (laughs) (laughs) my, my conclusion was, and sometimes it takes me a bit to come to these conclusions. Um, is that I've, I've, I've never questioned Mike's intent. And, and we talk about this a little, Andre, just like, uh, and Gary Vaynerchuk actually told me this after Tokyo. Intent does not always equal outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it doesn't matter what your intent is. It's execution. Right. Yeah. In this specific scenario with you, it does. Because, it, because I know, like, I know your intent is and always has been good. Yeah. And so it was, it was good for, it was a good, um. I don't know. I guess I'm just saying, like, yes, I, I, you, you are a very good person. Yeah, you're a very good person. I, and I wasn't always, but I think it's something that I, 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 I was always deep down. Yeah. But then I, I was able to push it away for so long, and now, and now I, I try to let it rule everything that I do. And so, bro, bro, I realized this about you actually for the first time when we, I forget where we were. We were driving around the Yeti somewhere. There was like a homeless man at a gas station, and you're like, yo, can, we, can you give this guy like twenty bucks? I don't have any cash on me. I was like, I was like, I don't have any cash on me either. But like, what about him? Like, like, is it the, yeah, whatever. Yeah, and you're like, I, you, you go, I, I don't know. I just like, I don't know. Like, I just like doing this. And bro, ever since then, I've seen you chasing down homeless men, throwing <laughs> your money at them. Like, like they're running from you now. Yeah, I know. Like, do you shop and take my money? And I, I, uh, it, and, and, and by the way, like, you know, say what you want about that act. There's more there. I like, I hope, I always hope that they would take more from the conversation that I have with them. I'm not, I'm not a, I don't ever want to be the here's money guy. I want, I want to know what's going on. How are you feeling today? Like you, you, I think you, the part you left out from that was I gave them a, a big hug too. It was at a gas station. I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh yeah. About. Yeah. It, it's funny. Cause when we go to Watts, yeah. the Watts empowerment center yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm playing with the kids. It's like I'm playing with the, the, the underprivileged kids, oh, yeah, the, the children, yeah, bro. Yeah, Every time I look over, I'm like, I wonder what Mike's doing. I wonder what everyone in the squad is doing. It's interesting to see like who resonates with what. Like I really enjoy hanging with the, the children, yeah, <laughs> like uh-huh. fucking around. Yeah. I look at Mike, and you're always talking to the teenagers, yeah. the ones who actually probably have real problems now, mm-hmm. instead of just like being a kid. And some are even older. They're, they're yeah. I, bec- the reason is is because those kids have been, are 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 thankfully thankful thankfully for the for the people that work at Watts Empowerment Center and other places like it they're being nurtured and brought up in an environment that instills value and moral fiber in them hmm. and they're being given the things that they need to do to to be given so that by the time they're 13 15 18 years old they can make the right decisions hmm. 
unfortunately, the 18, the 20 year olds, the 22 year olds, the 26 year olds that have been banging since 13 have been putting in work on the streets, have been selling on the corner since they were 13 years old. Mm. They missed that opportunity. They didn't have a Watts Empowerment Center. And if mm. they did, they weren't at it. Mm. And, and pr probably, you know, and I like to think, and this is another, you know, big point for the book. I like to think that when people know my story, they're, they're willing to let me in and tell me theirs. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so when I sit with the, with the dudes that like could have caught a fucking body in the past week, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and yo, like drug addiction is not the only evil that's all consuming. Yeah. Gang bangers. Mental illness is a huge one that we barely fucking scrape the surface of. Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. I talk about this. I talked about in this book. Everyone's suffering, although different, is the same. I was an addict for fucking eight years. Someone else lost a son. Someone else lost an arm. Someone else stubbed their toe. And that's it. Each one of those person has endured the worst pain they've ever endured, whether it's a stubbed toe or some other shit. Pain is only relative to the person who has go gone through it. And so if you are suffering, if you are feeling pain, then we can relate. But it's, it's, it, that, that is that, that relatability, that ability for somebody to say, yo, you have suffered in a similar way as I have to a similar degree that I have. There is not, I've said this before. I do not believe there's any community in this world as powerful as those suffering. The ability to relate to someone else who has a story similar to yours, I wish so badly that every addict, every mental illness sufferer had a mirror, a person like them that had a similar story that they could just talk to. Because it did wonders for me, dude. It did wonders for me to talk to people, bro. And not everybody has that. And I feel so badly for people that have no one. Because they're watching the show right now. We're, mm -hmm. we're their fucking people, bro. And the book. And the book. I have a couple more things, but they're yeah. kind of deep. Yeah. I, I also think I also think this has been a phenomenal episode, and I uh, appreciate how open you are. And you're on fire right now, so I'm just gonna keep kind of picking your brain because <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're killing it. Um, how do you implement character notes? Because part of the reason <laughs> I, I use the word "big brother" with you yeah, is because yeah, like yeah. you do, you you work with me a lot on on adopting character notes. Yeah, these are the hardest fucking notes. To implement because like with me, I, we, I've been open about it. My, my delivery can be subpar. And we were talking about it this morning. I go, I, I was, I was screaming at the table. I go, fuck the golden rule. It's the wackest rule I ever. It. I hate it. Treat others how you want to be treated. No, it works 90% of the time. But if you're like me and you like honest, open, candid feedback, turns out not everyone likes honest, open, candid feedback. So how do you implement a character note when someone gives a note that is literally coded into your DNA, bro. I have to go against my genetic code to watch how I say things. You see my dad, everyone knows how my dad like talks and just delivers it. He doesn't give a fuck, he just says it. And sometimes yeah. I'm the same way and it's so hard. And you made a comment this morning about, I think you mentioned the character note and you go, I gotta do this in my life too. It's probably gonna take me 10 years. And I said, that's good self-awareness. Yeah. But like, but how, how do you, how do you d handle and and, and do those notes that really strike you to the core and go directly against the fiber of your being. It's so funny that you talk about this because we we've been through, we've done so many. Yeah. And there was another person who was very infamous in your growth and your character notes. And that was Chloe. Yeah. I, and I, we, yeah, I'm, we definitely don't touch that topic very much. There's a pa small paragraph where I was very, thankful for her and she did an incredible job in that in that very tough period after tokyo for you and helped you grow immensely um we've done so much work and i think it's it's funny that you asked me the question it's so weird that it almost is to me is mathematical it's almost a it's almost a math or a science because I have to, de as you said, I have to deprogram you before I'm able to program you. Dude, dude. I have to tell uh. you why the 20 years of someone telling you that when you, someone, when your landscaper fucks up, you should go out and say, fuck you, motherfucker. I'll fuck your wife tonight if you don't do this. Right. <laughs> Which is what GP would say. No. Well, well, all right. Sorry, GP. But something in that vein. Well, I have to tell you why 
that's not going to be the thing that actually works. I had to deprogram you on so many things and give you mathematical reasons as to why they're, the delivery is so fucking important. That rule of it's not what you say, it's how you say it is one of the most important things anyone will ever teach you. And I'm not an expert at, at executing it myself, as you could tell by my sometimes fucking up on my own delivery on the show. But for whatever reason, when, we're, when it's just us, because that's, that's another huge thing that people don't understand. They think it's Mike and Logan from either Logan Paul Vlogs, The Night Shifter, and Impulsive. It's close, but there's a there's a lot of minute and 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 strange differences in real life. For whatever reason, I'm able to to visualize what's happening in these in these personnel and relationship situations that you have going on and help you with those yeah. better than I could even help myself. And and you've seen it, Andre's seen it, Danny's seen it. Like whenever we have those kind of issues, I I, I for whatever reason I'm able to do that with you. And I think it I think it comes down to this math that is very inclusive of empathy for the other person. And it's a lesson that you have you had to learn after Tokyo and it was a very big lesson for you and it yeah. was taught to you the hard way v- harshly by a lot of people how important that fucking lesson was. Yeah. But I think it's something that you're still trying to nail absolutely absolutely and, and we all and we all are but i'm not even i'm not even close i got i got exponentially better but still not even close the, and and the biggest thing was and it was a, and it's a lesson for me as well is not it's so big to not expect other pe- people to act the way that you would and so when you tell someone yo uh you just like okay i'm gonna use a an example fuck <laughs> i'm gonna use hayden as an example okay this is just an example Hey, you give Hayden the footage. He's given you 10 vlogs in a row that are killer. Five million a pop. Bangers. First time you've given him some cleanup. He has a rough day. He has a fight with Ashley. He's been locked up. He's lonely. Whatever the fuck it is, right? He gives you a subpar piece of work. Now, you could say, and you have said, Hayden, what the fuck went wrong for that? <laughs> what the fuck happened? Yeah. But I have implored you to try to understand and be empathetic with the situation that got you to the place that you're yeah. in. And as you've done that, you've I guarantee you've seen a massive increase in productivity from massive. The team. Did you did you see the way I was uh, talking to him last night? Did you, you, re- you listen great, to the voice notes? Yeah, yeah. I felt felt good about you were that. You're doing a great job. Felt good about you've it. You've been crushing. Felt it. good about that. But I was I was taught in a corporate setting after being a dog walker, and I wish there was a dog walker for Broly right now because he's barking incessantly. <laughs> that. All these things. I was taught a lot of this through the corporate world. That's why. That's part of the reason you're so valuable because mm-hmm. part of the problem with everyone on this team and everyone I work with is that we're it's a bit more like we work together, but we live together. We oh. see you every day, yeah, yeah. like the X Y Z, and so. I, I I don't talk to them like a colleague. I talk to them like my boy. Yeah. Yo, what the. What 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 happened today? Yeah. What why 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 is this a why piece is this you you gave you gave me ten beautiful edits. I have I need to know what what you did. Did you were you did you spend two hours on this? And then now I'm now I'm going into boss mode. Yeah. But I'm also your friend, so I'm approaching it like a homie. It's tough. It, yeah, and you've helped me a lot with it. And and so I guess I back back to the original question, like what empathy is empathy. Rue every single note you give someone, every single judgment you make on someone, every single critique you give that person, whatever place that is, whether it's corporate, family, whatever, in a place of understanding what it feels like to be in that person's shoes. So important. So fucking important. When someone tells to me says to me, yo, my work's a little subpar today because I'm depressed. I woke up this morning and I between you and me. I didn't want to get out of bed today. I'm depressed. I say, <laughs> rewind, eight years, been there. Now I'm with you as depressed. Wow. Mike. Now I'm depressed, Mike. Talk to me. I'm just bitch How ass, do- blessed <laughs> ass, fucking <laughs> privileged Logan. You, I no, suck. you worked your fucking ass off to get here. Yeah. You worked <laughs> your ass off to get here. But the one thing is you fortunately, as I said to you today, had the luxury of getting it right the first time. Oh, yeah. You said, I'm going to be a YouTuber. And you were the best YouTuber in the world. And it was like that. It wasn't like that, but it was it was the right choice and you got it. Yeah. Every single person watching this, 99.9% of the people watching this, whatever you want the stat to be, didn't get it right the first time. Mm-hmm. And to and you cannot devalue or discount or 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 fail to understand how it feels to be 23, 25, 27, 29, 32, and not know how you're gonna provide for the rest of your life. 
It's a horrible feeling. Mm. It's a confusing feeling. It's stressful feeling. It could, it could fuck with you. Or if your work is subpar, or if, you know, the biggest YouTuber in the world thinks that you could be a big YouTuber and you're asking for his opinion and he says, I don't fucking think you got it. So it's, it's, there's a coming from a place of empathy for the other person is the most important thing I could, I could ever say when it comes from a, c- comes to a critique standpoint. Nobody wants to get told, yo, your, your shit sucks. Yeah, it sucks. You except you. Cause you're, you're sick fuck. <laughs> Bro, my shit sucks. Someone <laughs> please tell me like, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think I know the answer to this question. Yeah. Uh, what is the most Hollywood moment? The, the moment Ooh. that you, you realize, yo, this ain't Connecticut anymore. So many, so many, but it's probably, it probably would be a party in the Hills yeah. somewhere. I mean, there, there have been nights where, um, ugh, there's one, there's one party you, uh, I don't know if I don't, you didn't come to it. I think I heard about this one. There was a party that Stoss threw yeah. and it was, it was Stoss and Kylie Jenner's, uh, Halloween party. And I, I, I'm, this fucking idiot. Like I, I still was just, just getting the night shift off the ground. Like things were just starting to cook. And I'm, I put on this skin tight, uh, bat, uh, Spider-Man. Wait a second. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm drawing a, I'm not going to say, it. okay. So I put on the skin tight Spider-Man outfit and I walk in and I walk into the party and I go with, I go with banks and I, I've been very, you know, outspoken for my love for banks. I fucking love the kid. He's the weird street kid like me, scumbag who fucking made his life better and crush. I love banks. Shout out banks. We walk into this party and right off the bat, it's this big house. Like it's this beautiful mansion, but all of a sudden like there's Chris Brown. Wait, Chris Brown, Chris Brown's there. And then there's Kylie. She's sitting next to Chris Brown. French Montana's chilling. There's not a lot of people here. Why? First of all, why am I here? <laughs> why the fuck am I at this party right now? Like I was walking dogs a couple years ago. Why am I here? Yeah. And then me and Banks are standing in line for the bathroom. I got to piss. And down walks Drake. And Drake walks down the stairs. Big ass fucking Drake, dude. Walks up. Somehow, some way, fucking daps up Banks, which I thought was crazy. Looks at me. And by the way, like... I've met I've met a ton of people now. Like I've partied with fucking Abel from the weekend. You were there that night. We've done a ton of shit. And I'm usually just, yo, what's up? At least dap them up, like be cool. I could not muster a word for Aubrey, for Drake. Not a single fucking word, bro. There's just nothing there. You we talked about you had a very similar experience, or it just didn't go properly. No, bro. My experience was she was there. Yeah. I, bro, I've he just like for five minutes just talked to me about some of the most profound yeah, shit yeah, I've heard yeah. in my life. Yeah. And here I am, I'm about to like try to reciprocate. And I was just like, yeah, man, it's fucking like, you know, it's all about hard work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you trying oh, to be cool. Uh, no, bro, because he, he just, he said some amazing, very kind, thoughtful shit to me. I was like, bro, you know, it's all about the grind. <laughs> You gotta fake it till you make it, man. You gotta, you gotta keep hustling. So, okay, that was so what I was gonna like ask you as well. Yeah, it's just that, it's that kind of stuff. You're, also, a, you're yeah. a hustler. That's the one thing uh, for sure of the many takeaways of this podcast. You're, yeah. you're, you're a major hustler. Yeah, speaking are of which, you, the are, fifth are, idol of available <laughs> on Amazon right fucking now. Amazon paperback, May 5th, aka today. Paperback and ebook. Yeah, what were you saying, hustler? Are you hustling <laughs> me? Is our friendship real? Or is this some sort of, like, is your tweet about chestnut checkers like, are you playing chess with me? There's a lot of people out there, a lot of influential people in your life, loved ones even, or old loves. Who would believe that? And who would like to believe that? And not actually, you know what? Fuck that. There's none. There's really none now. But at one point, there were more. Yeah, for sure. Is that because you got rid of all of them? Yeah, I had them all right. <laughs> no, 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 no. When I, when I joined this team, when I first started offering those character notes, yeah. There was never a, I was. There was never a, a yo. There's a future here for you, man. Here's a, here's some money. I paid my flights. I I flew on my own dime. I came here. There was never a yo. I'm gonna tag you in this. You're gonna have a channel. You're gonna do this. You're gonna do that. When it came time that I was offering so much value, especially post Tokyo, where someone said to me, "This was a big moment for me. This was a big fucking moment for me." When the, the whole world was in disorder and everything was, was falling to shit and the house of cards was falling around me, you said to me, I said, we were going over who the next leader of this organization was going to be on the business side. And I said, I don't fucking like him. I don't fucking like him. And I got pissed off. And you said, 
Well, then why don't you fucking so do it? Why don't you do it? Why don't you be the CEO? If you, if you know so well, you have corporate experience, you'd crush it. I said, I could have had it all right there. Could have been the head of this team, took on a percentage, could have fucking ran the team, been a massive part of the organization yeah, yeah. right there. And that was before we were even close at all. And I said, Logan, I'm not the person for that job, but I will help you find that person. <laughs> that you did. And, and when, and when six months after that, he said, yo, it's time to get you on payroll. What do you want? I said, you tell me what I want. You get throw. Let's, let's play with some figures. You tell me what you're comfortable with and I, and I'll do it. Those could be incredible chess moves. Or I, I guess at the end of the day, how do you ever, how do you ever really know? I guess the, the biggest answer to that is what do I do for you? When there is no victory for, in it, do you know what I'm saying? It's like last, so, so like last what, night is my is just one quick example of like, you came home stoned, you found an owl, and you said, <laughs> not to me, but you just said, damn, I'm fucking hungry right now. Yeah, I just kind of said it. I'm I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I get something to eat. Now I'm already a fucking leader on this team. I'm a part of the podcast. I got my night shift. I already fucking you already gave it all to me. <laughs> There's no victory left. And I got that frying pan out and I dumped that steak in Holy there. Holy fuck, you made me tacos. <laughs> made you made me you steak taco. tacos. It's what do you do for somebody when there's no victory? And that's the biggest, and that's another question that goes back to this book. What are you, what are you doing for someone that can give nothing back to you? In a, in a lot of ways, you've already given it all to me. I could go move in Alana's tomorrow. Next question. <laughs> life looks pretty fucking good for you right <laughs> yeah, now, bro. Yeah, yeah. What does sure. a perfect life look like? And then we'll close it. Okay. How, how does it get better? You probably could buy a car. You don't have one, and you have thousands, hundreds of thousand dollars. Yeah, but... <laughs> well, I don't have a car. I always crashed all my cars. There's one thing I can't get right now. I haven't had it. I've never had it. It's unattainable. It's fugazi, fugazi. I can't get it. I got money. Got one of the baddest bitches in the fucking world. Best friends, dope as fuck. Everything's cool. Got a clothing company. Dope ass yeah, show. Yeah. Everything's going great. Fantastic. Somebody find a way to get my mind to stop racing. Uh, Put me on a lazy river. <laughs> make me calm. Give me peace of mind. If my how does my life get better? Make me fuck. Make me okay with the moment. Mm. Make make me satisfied and and just chill, and not upset and not confused and anxious. And what's gonna happen next? Where am I gonna be? What's gonna happen? What if this doesn't happen? What if that happens? What if it doesn't happen? I know that when I sit on that show, I'm gonna sweat. I'm gonna sweat. How long am I gonna sweat? I'm gonna be Make that stop. Please, please. I'm begging you. Please, somebody make that fucking stop, bro. You regret this. You did this to your mom. Now you can make it. Blah, 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 blah. Always. 20, it's been that way since I was a kid. Goal, so goal number one is find peace of mind. But a little bit, something a little bit more fun. Man, 10 years from now, me and my homie, my best friend, writing a comedy movie, working with a big studio, yep, and yep. producing fucking heat. Oh, traditional okay. filmmaking, bro. Uh, you know that it, what's your most Hollywood moment was one thing, but what was your happiest moment so far in LA? The answer will always be yeah. making the flat earth documentary. <laughs> it is my favorite thing that I've ever done. Play, playing Pete's friend and talking about poor Pete that fell off the side of the flat earth is one of my shining moments in filmmaking history for me. And that felt so good to me, even when we did the scripted work a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so fun. Just writing that and then working on it with you yeah. and like having your friends to like knock ideas off of and collaborate and then actually seeing it come to light and yeah. building this beautiful piece. <clears throat> that is what I want for my life. And whether it's this book becoming a movie or something that we create, I want to make movies and I want peace of mind. Amazing. Woo! You did my, it, Mike. Mike Malak. I think, I think, I mean, I think this podcast rivals Evans for sure. I love Evan. This is, this was phenomenal. Thank you for your honesty, how open you were, your vulnerability. And I was going to tell you this after the podcast as a note. Yeah. Oh, nice. But I'm going to do it now because I like it. You sitting across from me as the guest, I could see a pure authenticity to you that I don't know if I've ever seen before. Like I, everything you said was said with such conviction and truth. It was, it was magical, man. And it was really beautiful. And I can see it cause I finally got to look you in the yeah. eyes when you tell these stories. That's, that's a big one. It's the subject matter, but it's also like, 
I wasn't fighting at all. Like it yeah. was like we were having a conversation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which was great. It was really great, yeah. man. So uh, thank you. Yeah, guys, he said it, but uh, his book, The Fifth Vital, is now available on Amazon. I'm going to put the link in the description. And just excited for this week. We got a massive week ahead of us. Him Big pa- fucking week. Him- impulsive, baby. Fucking number one podcast in the world. Continue there. Keep rolling. Let's go. Hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time. Mac, Mac, also, hey, thank you, bro. Yeah, thanks, hey, Mac. Mike, crush it, bro. <laughs> thank Congratulations. You. Thank you, bro. Hey, if you're watching this and you're sad, keep going. If you're having struggle, if you're stressed out, if you're, if you're feeling like you're not going to make it, you don't know what to do with your life, you've been addicted, you've been stressed out, or whatever. Keep pushing forward. Shit will start happening for it and it won't stop and it'll be beautiful. Bye. Uh, I don't I can't end on that. <laughs> Bye.